thank you all so much for coming. People are still joining us, but that's wonderful. I'm Claire. Um, I'm just going to say a quick hello and then pass it off to Edith of the Timber HP team. And then obviously the star of the show, who you all are here to see, um, Jacob, talking about the beam calculator. Um, I just want to call out, we've got a couple other Timber HP team members joining us. Their videos are up. We've got Jason and two Alexes, and um, they're going to be helping field the chat and the Q&A. So any questions, really try to keep those to the Q&A box. And then in the chat, we welcome you to share any information about yourself. Um, and Edith will ask from, for some specific information. But any questions in the Q&A would, in the Q&A box specifically, would be very helpful. Um, and I'll let you take it away, Edith. Amazing. Thank you, Claire. And thank you, everybody, for taking the time out of your day to learn more about wood fiber insulation and embodied carbon and come away with a real tool that you can use, which is the beam calculator. So we're so stoked to have Jacob here. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen here. Um, we are Timber HP by GoLab. GoLab is, there's, is kind of our parent company. We were born out of a partnership um, uh, from an architecture firm called Go Logic, which is now Opal Architecture. So Go Lab is a little bit of a residual name, but we're moving forward under the name Timber HP. Um, but first of all, to start everything off, we're just wondering who you are and and uh, how familiar are you with wood fiber insulation? We'd love to hear about um, your background. Are you a builder, contractor? Um, and then, and then, yeah, how, how familiar are you with wood fiber? One being you've never heard of it before, 10 being you could probably give this presentation instead of me. So um, in which case, if there are any 10s out there, we should talk. Uh, so pop, pop those answers into the slide and, and uh, it'd be great to see who's out there. Let's see. So a little bit about our name, Timber HP. Um, HP stands for High Performance, Healthy Planet, and Healthy People. And this really cap encapsulates our three main pillars um, of our brand. And uh, we lead first and foremost with high performance because if we're going to make an impact in the world, which is what we hope to do, uh, our product has to function. It has to be great to handle and use and improve our built environment. Um, and so one of the amazing things about wood is it is very high performing. And um, we'll talk a lot about the performance attributes a little bit later in the presentation. But we also have an amazing story to tell around how we're supporting a healthy planet with our recyclable, renewable, non-toxic and carbon negative insulation solutions. And we're also supporting healthy people, whether that's you know the inhabitants of the building itself um, with low toxins in your walls um, or the, the contractors who are installing the insulation. Um, and so, yeah, that's a bit about our name, HP. Why are we called Timber HP? And now you know. So we will dive into carbon very deeply here. Um, but, you know, we're also here to celebrate the wood fiber insulation manufacturing coming online in North America under the name Timber HP. And so we'll be producing three products. We have our timber fill product, which is the dense pack or, or blanket insulation, um, much like a cellulose. We have timber bat, which is you know, the press fit bat for wall cavities, ceilings, rafters, attics, etc., and especially for acoustic insulation. And then we have our continuous board insulation, which is primarily utilized on the exterior of the building. Um, and we'll dive into a bit more of these attributes coming up in a little bit. Let's see. So the rollout this year, this year, 2023, the year we've all been waiting for for so long. Um, this is when we'll be finally producing our products. Our timber fill will be our first product to come off of the manufacturing line. And that will be available in the springtime. So we'll have an uncertified product in April, and then we'll very quickly get our UL listing and, and start to sell certified product in the, in the very beginning of the summer. That will roll out in the summer as well, and board will be third to come online in the fall. Wood fiber insulation 
as some of you probably know, is not a new technology. We have not reinvented any wheels here. We're really borrowing the brilliance uh, of the development of this wood fiber product from over in Europe. Um, there's lots of manufacturing uh, producers in Europe. There's five more under construction right now. Um, where they're, they're reaching a billion dollar industry. Right now they're about $800 million industry. And the funny thing is, is that it's sold as a cost premium. And also the, the building typology in Europe is predominantly masonry construction. Only about a quarter in some areas is stick framed. And so the product fit with wood fiber insulation here in America is really exceptional because we are predominantly wood fiber I'm sorry, wood framed construction. And uh, we have an amazing resource of, of uh, sustainable forest fields and, and uh, um, uh, wood production already existing in the States. And Maine especially um, is a great place for our first mill to come online. We have, uh, we have you know, a vast resource of, of um, sustainable sustainably managed forests here in Maine. Um, and we've had a decline of paper mills in, over the last 60 years. So we've lost about six paper mills in the last six years. And, and so um, this, this pulp wood and these residual wood chips that are a byproduct of our lumber industry that would have gone to those paper mills, um, actually we don't really have a good market for those. And, uh, yet. And so when we come online with our wood fiber insulation, we'll be able to provide a, a real stable market for those, for that glut of residuals. Um, let's see. And, and, you know, right now we're, we're harvesting well below our replacement rate in Maine. And the, the green area here is, is, denotes the FSC and SFI certified timberlands. Um, and so Maine, Maine is a great place to start. And then there's also many other underserved wood baskets throughout the US that we could also expand into and help support. So the thing about wood fiber insulation is we're able to utilize an abundant waste resource that already exists from our, from our current lumbering operations and from our lumber mill operations. And so this is species agnostic, spruce pine, fir, hemlock trees that uh, are able to you know, be processed into lumber. And then we take that, those waste wood chips and bring them to our mill, mill them up, finally, finally grind them, um, steam and refine them, and then press them into boards and bats, or then just refluff into uh, fill insulation. So the story here in Maine really adds to the affordability of this product. And that's a, a question everybody has. Of course, in Europe, um, it's sold as it costs premium and then to ship it overseas is also exorbitantly expensive. And so there is only a select number of products that can afford to employ wood fiber insulation to date. And so we're here to help solve that problem as well. Um, because we are situated in a former paper mill in Maine, and uh, we have an, an abundant uh, resource of hydroelectricity right there on site. And our raw materials are about half the cost as they would be in Europe. And our, our energy costs are about a third of what they are in Europe. Um, and we have much shorter shipping uh, times and uh, expanses. And so the timber fill, we're uh, entering the market at a comparable price to all borate cellulose. Um, with timber board, it'll come in around the same price as, as your average foam um, and a slight deduct from mineral wool. And then the timber bat product will be situating in that sweet spot between fiberglass and mineral wool. So it'll be a little bit more than fiberglass, but again, a deduct from mineral wool. So just diving a little bit into some of the attributes of the, each of these um, insulations. The timber fill insulation will be our first one to market in the spring, as I mentioned. And this, of course, will be for a dense pack, cavity insulation, and stud walls. Um, 
and also loose fill blanket insulation for your attics. So what we do is we take those soft those softwood chips that arrive to our mill, we steam and refine them, grind them up, and then um, during that wet stage, we add boric acid, which is the fire retardant, helps us reach a class A flame spread, and it's also a mold and mildew and pest deterrent. So we're able to add that boric acid during the wet phase, um, which is a little bit different from your cellulose insulation. They have to add their boric acid during, the, you know, as a sprinkle on dry additive. Um, and so because we're able to add in our wet phase, it fully saturates that fiber and you don't have issues with leaching um, over time. And we're about we're, we're able to use about half as much as uh, your your average cellulose insulation. So it's a competitive R three point eight per inch, and it has um, you know great uh, great the 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 size and structure of the fiber keeps it from settling um, in your wall cavity. The timber bat insulation. Uh, it's the same feedstock and, and starts in the same process of our, of our timber fill insulation. Um, so we have that borate mixed in and then it, and then it diverges and uh, we add a little bit of bicomponent fiber. So that's this, um, that's a polyamide binding fiber to keep it uh, all intact and provide some flex and squish into our bat, which makes it easy to press fit into your walls. Here we have a competitive R4 per inch, and it's a vapor open, so it helps support those vapor open assemblies. Um, and again, this, is, this will reach a class A flame spread because of that borate blended in during the wet phase. We'll be sizing for all sorts of different wall applications, 16 and 24 inches on center, both for steel and wood frame studs. Um, one of the exciting things about the bat insulation is that we've done some acoustic testing on it and, uh, and it performs incredibly well, maybe even best in class, but we wanna be able to test our own product uh, before we can make such wild claims like that. But um, uh, this, is, this is huge implications for you know, multifamily housing and folks that are using uh, quite a bit more acoustic insulation than thermal insulation. Our continuous board insulation is for predominantly the exterior of buildings. Um, so here we have our wood chips that come off the, off the line. We steam and refine them as well. Um, and the additives that go into this board are uh, some adhesive, like a Gorilla Glue PMDI adhesive, and about 1% um, paraffin wax. And that helps with the high hydrophobic qualities of the wood. Um, and you can leave it outside on your walls or on your roof for several months without seeing any degradation or deformation at all. Um, and then the sizing here, will be uh, a bunch of different different thicknesses and, and several different densities as well, but ranging from one inch to nine and a quarter inches, um, all one continuous board. And depending on the, the density, we'll be able to reach about a 3.4 to 3.7 R value per inch. And again, supports vapor open assemblies. Um, one of the, the Perks here is that it also has a pretty high compressive strength. And here you can see Scott Dion, our chief marketing officer, nailing the board directly to the zip sheathing, which is a way that you can install uh, the, the um, smaller dimension boards. Um, so right now, this board reaches a class B flame spread with no fire retardants. But this is something we're working on, and we will definitely have a class A board coming off of the line um, in the not too distant future. So one of the things we're really excited about, well, we're excited about a lot with wood fiber insulation, but one of the, the main things that um, is a concern for installers, especially is the, you know, the one-to-one -one replacement 
attributes. Like, do I need to retool? Do I need to learn a whole bunch of new application uh, procedures? And um, the answer is maybe just a little bit, but you can cut this stuff with the tools you have. Um, there's a couple of fancy saws that, that we could provide as well. Um, you know, everyone loves new toys, new tools. But uh, yeah, the, the lift here and the learning curve is, is really quite small. And it's a familiar product. It's just wood. Um, and we're working on making it very accessible and very affordable for all of your above grade comprehensive assemblies. So this is really, I mean, we have fill, board, and bat. So it's really a comprehensive solution for a variety of your insulation needs for above grade. Um, so we're really supporting and wanting to encourage vapor open assemblies. And this really helps reduce the liability in your wall system. Um, if you have a vapor closed assembly uh, there, and if it's not detailed perfectly, uh, this could be a liability for trapping moisture and um, can lead to some degradation in, the, in your walls. Uh, with a vapor open assembly, that liability is, is quite a bit reduced. Um, vapor can dry to the inside or it can transfer through and, and dry all the way to the ex out exterior as well. And one of the things that wood fiber does as, as well, which is, is really quite exceptional, is that it's able to resist heat gain in the interior space. And there's a lot to be said here. Um, Jason Todd, who's who's with us answering questions at the moment, um, has a lot to say on this subject as well, and, and has written a couple white pages pages that will be featured on our new website. So keep stick a pin in this topic and and uh, and and come look for it later. But there's a lot to be said here as well. Um, I mentioned the the acoustic qualities. Uh, which makes it a nice, you know, quiet, safe, non-toxic interior. So we're really hoping to support, you know, healthy environments for your built structures in your interior spaces. So we'll dive into the carbon story a little bit, and this will be a little bit of a segue as I pass it over to Jacob. Um, I know I really flew through some of the wood fiber stuff, but I want to make sure that Jacob has has enough time to explain this incredible tool that um, he's been developing. Um, so just a little bit about carbon from our perspective and before I pass it on, but as you, as many of you know, uh, the built environment can, is a, is a, is a huge contributor to the, uh, you know, the carbon in the atmosphere at the moment. And um, we as designers, as manufacturers, as specifiers, uh, I feel ha really have an opportunity, an obligation, if you will, to start making the decisions to tackle this piece of the pie, the piece that we have control over, that we can influence. We're able to look at embodied carbon and operational carbon together in a really interesting way right now because you know, we're, we're getting a lot better at energy retrofits and, and using renewable energy. So this Op so this um, operational energy here is really going to start to uh, flatline as we make these continue to make these improvements with operational energy and where our energy comes from. Um, and so the, there's there's a growing focus on embodied carbon for good reason um, as we build more and as we really you know tune into where our building materials come from, this uh, embodied carbon question becomes a lot more important. And so the carbon cost of conventionally built structures is, is, is really high, as you've seen. Um, it needs to be addressed significantly in order to in reduce the climate impact of our built infrastructure. Um, and so uh, let's see. Here we have from the RMI Institute, uh, the, the biggest players in embodied carbon at the moment. This is you know, our, our current snapshot of, um, of our built environment. And 
as you can see here, concrete is really, you know, it's, it's, it's the biggest elephant in the room. It's the one that, uh, that takes the most amount of carbon to, to bring onto the job site um, to produce and deliver and manufacture. Um, insulation is second in that, um, you know, th this, is, this provides a huge opportunity as well, insulation. With concrete, you know, there's, there's a lot of folks who are diving into CLT and ways to reduce um, the amount of concrete, but also there's lots of, lots of additives and improvements coming online to sort of tackle this biggest column here. And with insulation, we really haven't seen any progress in the field, uh, not, not really anyway. Um, we're still relying heavily upon, you know, high embodied carbon insulations that dominate the market. Um, so we are here to change that. Here we go, yeah, the insulation market is dominated by fossil fuel dependent products, devastating environmental impacts beyond embodied carbon um, and yeah, don't have to say much more about this. I think we're all pretty familiar with, with what's going on here. And so what we're hoping to do is, is really tackle this problem um, in a meaningful way with wood fiber insulation. And we're able to provide a scalable and affordable carbon storing solution. And uh, we feel like this can make a huge impact in our built environment. Um, this will be the only carbon negative construction installation available in the U.S. Uh, that can be sold at scale and cost competitively as well. And uh, there's, a, there's a lot to be said on this topic as well, and there's a lot of really good healthy debate uh, in the field at the moment. And maybe J Jacob can touch on this a little bit more, but it's that question of biogenic carbon and whether we want to you know, really lean super heavily on, on raw virgin wood to you start tackling our, our issues uh, with, with the built environment and rely upon it as a um, carbon storing device. Uh, I won't get too far into the weeds here, but one of the things that, is well wonderful about wood fiber insulation is that we're we're utilizing um, existing residuals and existing waste product. We actually got a huge amount of our funding as a solid waste um, uh, processing facility, and so um, this this uh, infographic here definitely applies to wood fiber insulation. We're able to utilize all of the or keep that carbon that's stored in the trees as it's growing um, and lock it into the built environment for the lifespan of the building and, and hopefully a lot longer. And um, the end of life question for the wood, you know, for, for our built environment, uh, for our LCA study um, and conversation is, is, is really an interesting one. Um, you know, what happens to the building at the end of, uh, at the end of its life. And we're hopeful that um, with all wood assemblies and really leaning into, um, you know, utilizing wood as much as possible in, in our assemblies, that the recyclability of the, of the um, structure itself at the end of its life, um, the potential for recycling it is a lot higher if it's all wood and it's much easier to, to kind of, throw into a hopper, grind up, turn it back into wood fiber insulation. So this is a topic that's front of mind for us at Timber HP, and um, we hope to roll out some recycling programs in the not too distant future as well. So I just have a very quick case study here. I'm going to fly through it so I can, I can pass it over to Jacob. Um, this is a project that uh, Opal Architecture, which is our sister company, um, uh, built over in Connecticut a few years ago, and really trying to lean into that all wood assembly. So we have we have we utilized cross laminated timber, some wood fiber insulation, and lots of wood products in the finish finishing. Um, we use tally to calculate all of the embodied carbon for each each of our materials. 
So in our wood products, we have a, a net of 56 tons of carbon equivalents, and then all the other building materials, steel, glass, concrete, et cetera, are at 79. So if we utilize the wood to offset the other building materials, we're at a net of 23 tons embodied. We're also to we are able to um, utilize some solar tiles and uh, harvest electricity on site. And so we also took into account our annual operational assessment, um, plug load, space heating, water heating, even charging the family car <laughs> offset against the solar tiles uh, production. Um, so we have a net negative production annually here. And looking at the 10 year cumulative payback, we're able to pay back the entire uh, building uh, after eight years. And I know I flew through that, but um, we'll, we'll, we, can, we can talk about that more. If you have questions, please uh, reach out to me in the chat as well. And here's a couple more um, photos. Just wanted to say, Briefly, that you know, we're crossing all our T's and dotting all our I's in term in terms of um, testing and compliance. Um, and again, if you have questions about details here, you can reach out to Jason um, or anyone on our team. We'll be um, going after a bunch of different product certifications like Claire, uh, Declare, and FSC certification. Um, Green Guard, Energy Star, and of course, this supports your lead efforts. And so that's it for me, a bit about wood fiber insulation and, and how hopefully we're helping to contribute to um, some real solutions for our embodied carbon in the built environment. Thank you, thank you, Ida. Um, Jacob, are you able? Oh, you're there. Amazing. I'm here. I'm in. All right. Uh, that was fabulous. Thank you so much for the opportunity to, um, yeah, share the share the webinar with you all. Um, really, just so pumped about this product and having this uh, resource available to all of us. So, thanks for all the work y'all are doing. Um, I'm Jacob Deborah Hewson. Uh, I wear a couple of hats. I'm the director of building science and sustainability with New Frameworks, or design build firm in Vermont, where I'm beaming in from. Um, and I'm wearing my hat with um, Builders for Climate Action. I'm the beam co developer and trainer and body carbon analyst with that crew, um, based primarily out of Canada, actually. So, see a bunch of metric values for some of the data I'm going to show you. Uh, so I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour of BEAM, uh, the building uh, emission accounting for materials tool um, that you can use to check out the impact the materials you're currently using and see some really good opportunities for how we can dramatically reduce some of those early climate emissions from our built environment um, through some better data awareness and decision making. All right. So we developed Beam specifically to fill a gap that existed in the sort of the tool space to give us awareness around what is the impact of the materials that we're using and how do we like quickly and effectively make changes. It's one thing to do a bunch of analysis, it's another thing to actually lead that to actionable decisions. And that was really our focus. So um, our team comes from the background of uh, a, a group of builders. We primarily build um, small and mid-sized buildings um, and the firms that that we represent are smaller firms. And a lot of the LCA tools that are out there and even some of the other uh, specifically carbon emission tracking tools that are out there really specifically designed around uh, both big buildings in terms of the materials that are represented in the uh, within the tool, as well as the interface. You may need 3D modeling design software, or you may have a uh, an input format that is really scaled towards larger projects, larger firms, more available soft costs to do that kind of analysis on a project. And we really and we recognize the vast majority of buildings that are out there uh, that are in a low rise space. Uh, just don't have access to those tools really effectively within the workflow in any given project. So we really set out to make a tool that was super easy to use, get really actionable information that could be used within the design space as a design and decision-making tool, not just something that spits out an output at the end of the day. Um, and it can be used inexpensively and quickly by folks that don't have a whole lot of time or appetite or interest in picking up and learning new tools. So that's the background behind why we really want to focus 
uh, on developing Beam. It's a tool uh, we spent about two or three years developing with a small group of us, and uh, I really stick to have it uh, available for free for our community to use uh, by a donation. Um, so one of the really exciting things about you, the development of this tool and part of the development process was using it to um, conduct a series of different benchmarking studies for different municipalities uh, to really try to wrap our heads around, okay, what is the current profile of emissions for the buildings that have already been built? Um, so this is looking at one study that uh, we did for about 500 homes in the Toronto area, uh, where you can see a pretty, pretty big range of the amount of emissions that are released uh, by buildings that already exist, the survey of existing building stock. Um, so this is what's already out there in the market, already being constructed, really big range on what the material carbon emissions are. I'm just going to define some metrics really quickly here. You see that kilograms of CO2e, um, the CO2e stands for carbon dioxide equivalent. So that is a metric that represents all of the greenhouse gases that are emitted from uh, the production of these materials and making them equivalent to their impact as if they were carbon dioxide. So methane over a 100 year period of time has roughly 20 to 25 times the impact of CO2. So it's CO2 E value would be 25. So that's what that metric represents. And it's divided by meters squared. Uh, that could be feet squared for you imperial folks. Uh, that's for uh, uh, averaging or, or uh, uh, assigning the total emissions to the area of the building so you can more easily compare across different buildings, not unlike energy use intensity or the energy use per square foot, for those of you that are familiar with the energy side of things. So giving you a quick span of a, you know, a four to five X multiplier from the lowest to highest impact of carbon emissions in these materials. What was really exciting is we really started digging into this data and looking at all the different options of how, of where or the sources of where the carbon is pooling in the building material stock and how we can reduce it is that there's a whole bunch of really just sort of like direct substitutions that can be made to have a really significant reduction in the impact of, of the, uh, the, the emissions of those materials. And so starting from the baseline, that can include um, using a lower carbon emitting concrete, um, replacing uh, loose fill insulation with the cellulose material, wood fiberboard showing up here as an awesome solution for replacing uh, petrochemical board stock insulation, looking at, looking at using engineered wood instead of masonry for cladding. And then some of these like flooring and drywall is just using the best available material within the category without even needing to switch materials. Um, so there's sort of a host of simple substitutions or just having the data to find the best uh, the best material uh, available within the class that doesn't require heroics or dramatic, you know, changing of your you know, business model or even the building design to be able to really have some significant impact. And the, again, the point of the tool is to um, make it, you, the, the old adage from the, I come from an energy background and the old adage is you can't manage what you can't, uh, you can't see. And so this is a, a mechanism being able to see what our impact is so we can effectively manage it. So just looking at the tool itself um, and sort of what, you know, what is shown and, and how, you can, how you can use it, um, the format of this is sort of a snapshot from the tool here. The format is um, a listing of a host of different materials within a series of different categories broken apart by assembly of the building that allow you at a glance to really understand what the relative uh, impact is from material A versus material B within a given category, and then be able to make selections in real time to add up and subtotal what the what the emissions are for that category of the building. And so uh, while we have these direct side-by-side -side comparisons of the different materials, this is all within the exterior walls category. So you can look at this from an assembly by assembly basis. The subtotaling is uh, seen at the top of the page uh, after you've selected a product. Another thing I'm really particularly excited about with Beam um, we, went, we are very strong proponents of the approach of not just doing less harm, but proactive good in the steps that we're taking. And so we're not interested in just reducing the emissions profile of buildings. Our goal is to create carbon sinks out of our buildings and using buildings to become the world's sixth carbon sink. And so this is why I'm super pumped to be associated with Timber HP and the work that they're doing as an example of how you can be taking carbon that would otherwise just re-aerosolize into the atmosphere and store it in our building in a useful and meaningful way for the life of that building. Um, so accordingly, when we're, we're using materials that way, we can assign them a negative carbon value. That's carbon that otherwise would re-aerosolize 
into the atmosphere as it goes through its carbon cycle. And we're interrupting that by repurposing that carbon into a useful building material and locking it in the building. And so being able to assign that negative carbon credit, we can really explicitly see how much, uh, how many emissions were released um, through the production of the material, how much storage credit we feel we can give, and then what the net emission profile of that material is. So you get a whole lot of information, um, particularly for bio-based materials. Um, I want to be really clear, unlike a life cycle analysis tool, which would be looking at the entire life cycle of a building or of a material and breaking apart all the different emissions at the different phases of the building's lifespan, we're looking specifically at uh, the material carbon emissions. So that cradle to gate phase, basically from the, the point at which materials are extracted or harvested through the point that they're manufactured and ready to leave the factory gate, if you will. That's the phase that we're looking at specifically. We're not looking at transportation to site or the construction phase emissions or the emissions released during the use or end of life uh, stages of a building's lifespan. And we're doing that specifically for a few reasons. One, um, particularly for low and mid-rise construction, the majority of those material of the emissions are within that cradle to gate phase. So it makes a lot of sense to really focus there. It's also by far the best most comprehensive and most accurate uh, data set that we have available to us. Um, and we're using, it was really important for us to get down to a product level of analysis and not just a material type. And so from the data source that we're using, which are environmental product declarations, kind of like a nutrition, an environmental nutrition label for your materials, if you will. Um, in using those uh, EPDs as our data source, uh, we can get really product specific and being able to compare between different options. Um, and that also really supports keeping the focus within that um, cradle to gate phase. And so the methodology around that is we're using these EPDs, these data sheets released by manufacturers or trade organizations to get the reporting of per unit, how what's the emission profile of this piece of wood or piece of steel or piece of glass. Uh, for those materials like timber HP that have a, a legitimate biogenic carbon storage value, uh, we're able to then back that out, uh, reveal that as a negative value like you saw on the prior, prior page and disclose what that carbon storage benefit is. Um, and then multiply that calculus by the quantity, the material quantity inputs, which is based on what you as the modeler puts into the tool. So we've done all the work on assembling all the data and getting the uh, calculations in place. You just put in what the areas and quantities of your assemblies are, and that gives an output of what the total uh, emissions are for that material assembly or building. Now, we're, we're, so far, we're really keeping our focus on structure, enclosure, partitions, and what I would call like primary finishes, like claddings, drywall, flooring. Um, it's where we've got the largest data set. Uh, those are the longest lived materials in the building. Um, and it generally is the place where we can make the most actionable decisions quickly and in a meaningful way to, to start improving our our, our outputs of our buildings, the outcome. Uh, we are looking at bringing mechanical, electrical, and plumbing into the tool. That's uh, one of my big focuses for this year. So keep your eyes out for that in the future. Um, and then some additional items like uh, membranes and paints we, we look forward to bringing in in time. Things like appliances, um, millwork, and then things outside the building are just beyond the scope of the tool. Um, and uh, either there isn't sufficient data to incorporate that yet, or it's just less uh, less actionable as a decision-making tool for the, for the user. So if you are looking for the tool, you're already sold and you don't even want to wait for the rest of the webinar. Um, restrain yourself. There's still more good information ahead, but this is ultimately where you will, uh, will direct you to get your own free copy of the tool. This entire project was um, funded without grants and without user fees. Um, we're a, a small, passionate, uh, somewhat scrappy group of people that are really dedicated to bringing this tool to the uh, to our community, uh, and we are excited. There'll be an updated version coming out in the next uh, month or two, as well as some additional improvements uh, in the year ahead. So we survive by donations. So if you uh, have used the tool, um, or if you are interested in the tool, we'd strongly encourage you to get your hands on it. If you're finding value in it, please um, uh, give back into the development process so we can keep improving the tool and bringing new uh, benefits to you in the future. Um, before we wrap here, I'm just going to give you a quick spin through the tool itself so you have a bit of a sense of what it's like to, to get your, your hands dirty with it and see how really how easy it is to get up and running and just start getting good information back pretty immediately. Um, so again, you'll download the tool from the website and what you will ultimately receive is a link to a private Google Sheet. Right now, this is uh, the platform is a, um, a very highly tricked out uh, Google spreadsheet. 
Um, so this is an online platform, a browser-based tool. Uh, you can put your basic product in project information up at the top. Um, some of this information you need to save a project and some of it is not essential. And then down below here is these are the primary inputs that you would have for your project. We really tried to keep this as simple as absolutely possible, knowing that uh, most of the folks using this tool do not have hours and hours to devote towards really intricate um, and specific inputs across every single individual material. So this, for those of you who've done any energy modeling, this formats very much like a box model. Really, we're just looking for the general areas and in a couple of cases, some volumes or lineal inputs to get the, the massing of the building for each of the different assemblies. So that's it for the primary like dimensional inputs. Um, that's the first step. Then the way the tool is broken out, as you can see down below here, there are these series of different tabs, each of which roughly represents a different uh, assembly in the building, different sort of like area of the building. And within that, there's a few additional inputs. Like for example, when you're looking at installation, the tool is going to ask you to put in an R value. And then once you do that, it will display this whole host of uh, results in the, uh, the emissions of these different materials. And so now you know, the, the uh, dimension area is carried over from that initial input phase. You can augment and sort of tweak uh, the exact percentage. Let's say you've got 50% of one material and 50% of another. You can adjust that with the percentages, um, so on and so forth. Uh, and really gives you the option here once you've decided, I think I would really like to go with that cheap wool insulation. You can just click that button. It again will highlight the fact you made that selection and will populate the subtotal box at the top. So in real, you have a real running tally of uh, the uh, emission profile of a given assembly as you're building out that wall within this tab. And all there's about there are 12 different assembly sheets, um, including a garage sheet that is really it's, you know, for garages or any other um, uh, outbuildings or other structures that are outside the sort of primary thermal enclosure of a building so that you can model that as well. Uh, and then within those, there may be some additional, there are some additional input vectors. I mentioned R value, framing, spacing would be another, wall or slab thickness, so on and so forth. And so those would be the additional inputs as required on a per assembly basis. And that's it. That's it for the inputs. Um, once you've gone through the various tabs and made all of your selections, uh, there is a review sheet, which uh, is really useful for a couple of different reasons. One, at a visual glance, using some of the shading and color coding, uh, you can get a sense of where the worst offenders and greatest heroes are within your materials profile. So you can really quickly understand where the carbon is and where the carbon storage is uh, is happening within your bill of materials. This is also, I find, super useful from a quality control, quality assurance standpoint, if you're trying to remember, did I get everything in here and did I double count anything? This is a great way of being able to scan through that and really do a little quality control and make sure you got your list uh, assigned correctly. And at the end, the last uh, tab there is a results page. We have a bunch of information um, that can really help with your analysis uh, and to look at the sort of the full profile of the building, especially if you're looking at a whole building uh, eye view of the of the project. And I'll break this down into some details in just a second. Um, one thing uh, I do this as part of my day job, so I find this a particular value. But for those of you that like really iterating and running scenarios and really doing a lot of comparisons and really trying to unpack it. Not only can you save a project, but you can um, save multiple versions of the project. So you can um, sort of load different versions of the project and be able to see you know, an improved scenario against the baseline scenario, that sort of a thing. That also is really useful in, in analysis. And for those of you that are uh, have been seeing all these meter squared tags and are starting to panic the have the metric system. No worries. There is a toggle to go between metric and imperial, and that will either do the calculations for you if you've accidentally done a whole bunch of imperial uh, inputs without making the switch, or, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, we'll, we'll make the conversion without uh, converting the values, or you can have it convert the values either way. So that can be useful, particularly if you're trying to speak between imperial and metric, uh, it'll make all those conversions for you right in the tool. Uh, so just looking a little bit more closely at the results that come back from this, um, really handy again, uh, especially if you're trying to communicate to folks that are uh, maybe less technical uh, or have a shorter attention span around carbon nerdiness, uh, to have some really good, clear visual 
um, bar graphs of, again, where is all of the carbon? It looks like the garage is holding a fair amount, but really the footings and slabs and foundation walls, those are the really big areas where we're seeing the carbon pooling in this building. That can be super useful um, if you're looking to make further iterative improvements or even just understand, oh, we really want to defend the specification around the amount of fly ash we're putting in that carbon in that concrete spec because, boy, those lines are really big. So those are some of the ways you may be able to use that information. We also look at uh, the sort of the the, the uh, values in two different metrics. The total net emissions that's the the whole whack of carbon uh, dioxide equivalent emissions in kilograms. Uh, we also break that down by square footage or square meter. Uh, again, looking at that on sort of boiling that down on a as a metric that's comparable across different buildings is really useful. We call it the material carbon intensity. Um, so you have that in both metric and imperial revealed here, and then. Because we've done a whole bunch of this benchmarking, we've got a really good pool of buildings that are already out there in terms of what the range of impact is. We have a scale that we provide just to give you a sense of, okay, five, is that good? Is that horrible? Spoiler alert, it's awesome. If you can get an MCI five in your buildings, you're crushing it, keep going. Um, but it will give you some sense of like, how, how is this building doing? Uh, should I be worried? Um, we also list out the highest carbon material applications, again, just to really highlight where the carbon is um, and invite the opportunity to revisit some of the selections and design decisions, particularly if you're early enough in the design phase, which I always highly recommend, model early and often so that you've got the easiest ability to make these changes as quickly as possible while it's still um, the most accessible within the design process to do so. Um, just blasting through the end here, so I want to leave time for some questions here. Um, a couple of different ways of using of doing the actual analysis. One is just doing simple material substitutions. In this case, we just made a single insulation uh, choice to, uh, to reduce the emissions by an order of magnitude. Another would be looking across different types of assemblies, a stud wall construction versus an ICF wall versus a structural insulated panel wall. And you can do an assembly by assembly comparison really easily. Um, you can also look at the assemblies inclusive of full materials, including the claddings and the interior claddings, and give you know more of a full picture of the assembly and compare them that way. And then, of course, you can look at the whole building comparison, uh, adding up all the varying materials and looking again. This would be an example of using the two different versions. Uh, a, so maybe this is your baseline or your sort of average approach, and this would be your reduced carbon approach, and be able to really see the full span of materials within the within the project. All right, I want to leave time to chat, so I'll stop there. The one other thing I'll just note is for those of you that are already super pumped and ready to go and want to dive in, um, Builds for Climate Action is offering our next uh, online course and training session for how to use the tool starting next month. It is super, it's probably the easiest and fastest way to get rolling with the tool kind of right out the gate um, and, and climb up the learning curve. So if you're interested, please join us and sign up at the website. And I will stop my share there. Amazing. Thank you so much, Jacob. That was so much information. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. We have one question in the Q&A box. And then if folks want to raise their hand, I can allow you to speak. And if you have a question for Jacob or Edith, you can ask it live. Um, the question in the Q&A box was just what constitutes a small versus big building, and then in parentheses, it says SF or SM size, question mark. So I think this was from oh, gotcha. a couple slides back in your presentation, Jacob. Gotcha, right. Um, great question. I would say it's relatively subjective. Um, when I think of building scale, I'm often thinking of height and lower than like three stories is uh, three to four stories. And some of that's a reference to code or some some housing um, sort of regulata regulatory um, structures will name three or four stories as low rise. And then the like four to 12, I usually see is the range for mid rise and above that would be high rise. That said, you can build some like absolutely enormous two-story buildings. Um, so then it gets to be a bit more subjective and less sort of formally defined. Um, but I generally would, would, well, okay, I'll just stop there because that, beyond that it becomes speculative. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We got another question in the Q&A box. And Devin, if that doesn't answer your question, feel free to raise your hand and add more. But um, we got another question that was, 
Jacob mentioned the beam tool was developed because of a gap in the market for smaller buildings. I work primarily on larger commercial projects, but find LCA tools are often complex and difficult to use unless trained in specific tools. Does beam work for larger buildings, i.e. do the products available to select the tools include products used in large scale commercial buildings as well? Great question. I'd say for the most part, yes. And I've actually used Beam quite a fair amount for that same reason. And actually in combination with Tally, which is one um, life cycle assessment tool that's designed to work with, with a, um, like a, a 3D modeling design program. Um, I use Beam right alongside with partially because it's really quick and easy to run scenarios, um, partially because it gives results immediately and I have to wait to the completion of a model to get an output, partially because I can start modeling immediately without needing to wait for a design to get to a certain level of completion, often by which point it's a little too late to go backwards and change, say, the massing or evaluate the massing. So um, yeah, I've used Beam a number of times on institutional buildings in the like 20 to 50,000 square foot range really successfully. Um, I would say, Candidly, there's probably a few classifications of some like some steel framing objects um, and maybe some like particular like you know hyper specific commercial cladding products that may not be represented there. Curtain walls is probably the other thing that's um, not really well represented in the tool. Uh, other than those, though, I've had I've had really good success using Beam, both standalone and adjacent to an LCA tool. Um, and again, depending on what your process is, what questions you're trying to answer. Um, I, I could go on for quite a while about the whole like design and analyzing side of it. A tool is only as good as, as how you're choosing to use it. Um, and so, yeah, I would say you will get information from an LCA tool, including the full life cycle span, as well as a whole bunch of assumptions around down to individual fasteners that Beam is not going to give you. There, I would ask the question of, is that, you know, uh, all the information you need, does that support the questions you're trying to answer? And that's why often as someone that's a little more deep in the work than the average person uh, will often use more than one tool to answer different questions at different times. Totally. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and Alex Donnelly put the link to register for your, your upcoming webinars to dive more into this in the chat. So people um, feel free to check out. There's a bunch of links um, in the chat. Anybody else have any other questions? We don't have, um, we've got a few more minutes. So um, feel free to raise your hand or put something in the Q&A. While we're on the topic of upcoming presentations, I will just say that our next month's presentation um, is all about flow through assemblies, vapor open assemblies with our very special guest, uh, Joe Seabrook. And so that will be March 16th and um, you can, yeah, please do register for that one. I think it's going to be a lively conversation with lots of nerdy wall details and really diving into the science behind uh, vapor open uh, flow through assemblies. Um, amazing. Uh, I'm sure Alex will throw the link into that in the chat for that as well. And when it looks like we have a hand raised. So I'll, um, I think Nevin, if you unmute yourself, you should be able to, to ask your question live. Hi. Hi. I had a question about the transportation um, impacts once um, the material leaves the factory. Um, so I know this is true with a lot of um, these tools is that they, you know, they don't count the transportation after it leaves the factory. And I, I'm having a hard time, like in my own research, trying to figure out um, there seems to be like, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm sure it's all over the place because every situation is different, but there seems to be a lot of different information as to like how much the transportation from the factory to the building site on all the stages in between mm -hmm. um, can impact the total, um, yeah, the total energy gone into a, or CO2E gone into a product. Um, and I was wondering if you guys, uh, or how you guys are thinking about that um, and if you guys have any like rules of thumb right now um, for that, or or if you guys are thinking about coming up with tools to model that more in the future. Um, and then I'm just also wondering if if there are ways to get involved in this project if you if someone were to say have a lot of free time, they want to be involved. Okay. Just 
Theory, hypothetically speaking. Um, <laughs> well, I'll answer the um, the last question first. Yes, please, by all means. Um, I would reach out to uh, jump on the Builders for Climate Action website, and there'll be a contact us link that, um, by all means, feel free to, to reach out to the team and um, let us know how you're interested in being involved. And um, yeah, we'd be thrilled to have, have support in the movement for sure. So thanks for your interest. Um, answering the... Um, the transportation from um, manufacturing to site, A4 in the parlance of life cycle assessment. Um, so there's a couple of ways of doing that. Um, if you're using a full LCA tool, life cycle assessment tool, it'll give a default value. And I've looked into those quite a fair amount. And I find, again, for the type of building that we're generally referring to for the purposes of this conversation, so low to mid-rise, primarily wood frame construction type, um, type uh, buildings, you're in the like 5%, maybe 5 to 8% um, of the uh, total uh, showing up in that transportation realm. Now, I have done uh, quite, a, quite a bunch of studies of particular materials and groups of materials um, for certain, for different projects. Um, that often shows up in a couple of, couple of cases. One, high mass materials, like we're thinking of bringing in 70 tons of stone from South America. Could we give me an impact on that? Yeah, that's gonna be really different than shipping some wood cladding around. And so that mass is a huge factor. And um, I, you know, within my practice as a, as a consultant and analyst, when I see really high mass materials, that will be a group of materials that I would suggest, hey, let's take a minute and just do some, some quick modeling on this. There's some great tools out there, um, uh, all the names of which are escaping me, but will can really help quickly look at the transportation emissions based on transportation mode. And this is where it gets super complicated, is actually figuring out how material gets from point A to point B. And for those of you who have been in the industry in the last three years, the word supply chain, I'm sure, is well emblazoned within your consciousness. And um, in trying to actually track this down, where when you look at the way an LCA uh, database or LCI, like cycle inventory uh, database, is, is organized and how the assumptions they're making around that transportation, they're often looking at um, you know, either a, a set um, uh, an assumption of a set distance uh, and a set uh, type of transportation from where the closest manufacturing spot may be to where a site is. What we've found is that it is not uncommon for a product to be manufactured in one location, sent to a distribution center in another location, sent to a store in a third location, which is then sent back to some other store someplace else because they're out of stock, which is then making its way onto the job site. And that's super common to the point in which it makes it kind of maddening to try to really nail down and, and get specific around those transportation emissions. It's also nothing we really have great control over in general. And so the other place we've done some particular study is I'll use cladding as another example. I worked on a project pretty recently where they were looking at, well, what would be the difference if you use a local cedar product versus a cedar product from the West Coast versus a um, like a, a, a warranty engineered product that is coming from overseas. So I did a study looking at those really different uh, transportation modalities and distances across, a, you know, where there was a legitimate choice between different products that the carbon impact was going to have a decision-making influence. So I know not everyone has the ability to do that custom analysis, but it does get so custom so quickly, it's really hard to just bake into a tool. And it was, again, when I referred at the beginning, why we sort of restrained the beams view to the, the product level, the cradle to gate, it's because the simplifying assumptions around that transportation were just a little too, um, uh, I guess, vague or, or perhaps inaccurate, I would say, or subjective, um, prone to variables, all those things um, that we decided to restrain accordingly. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for your question. Mm -hmm. Um, and it looks like we're just about at time. We don't have any outstanding questions. So I think if folks have any other follow-up questions, they can reach out to us at info at timberhp.com. And Alex put a link to the Builders for Climate Action contact link in the chat so they can reach out to Jacob there. Um, follow us on all the social medias. Anybody else have any final words, Edith or Jacob? Otherwise, thank you all so much for joining us. 
I would just say every month we have um, a virtual product knowledge workshop like this. So it's the third Thursday of each month. And of course, as I said, Joe Stebrick is ne next month, but please visit our events page, timberhp.com slash events. And we'll be posting each of those virtual product knowledge workshops as they come online. Um, so yeah, and definitely please sign up for our newsletter and you'll, you'll hear about all of those coming down the turnpike there as well. And I'll just say someone that's been in the um, carbon storing and bio-based building space for a really, really long time. I can't say how thrilled I am to have to reach be coming online and having access to these products and bringing them to scale that can really, um, really start to move the needle on the emissions profiles of our building. So thank you all so much for the work you've done and we're really excited to be working with your products in the year ahead. Thank, thank you, Jacob. We are too. <laughs> yeah, that means the world. Thank yeah. you all so much. I think we'll sign off. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody.